Oh, welcome everybody to our National Marine Sanctuaries webinar series. We're very pleased that you're joining us today. Uh, we do the webinar series. It's hosted by the NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And we find over the years, it's been a great way to connect with formal and informal educators, as well as scientists and students and other interested members of the public. So we hope you enjoy today's presentation about lionfish. We have nearly 700 direct registrants from over 15 countries. So welcome to all of you. I also want to do a shout out to the Hatfield Marine Science Center in Oregon, who may be having a group together watching today's lionfish presentation. Uh, as an attendee, you've joined GoToWebinar in listen-only mode. If you have any technical issues, go ahead and put them into the question box of your GoToWebinar control panel. And also, if you have questions for myself or the presenter today, then please put it into that same area. So let me kick off and introduce myself. My name is Claire Fackler, and I am the National Education Liaison for our Sanctuary System. I have a few intro slides. I wanted to let everybody know that uh, 50 years ago, Congress passed some landmark uh, environmental legislation. So we are celebrating 50 years of ocean and coastal conservation. Really, uh, it, sparked, it helped spark the birth of the modern environmental movement in the United States. So we're celebrating 50 years for the Clean Water Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act, and of course, our very own National Marine Sanctuaries Act. So if you're an avid social media user, go ahead and use the hashtag 50OCC for 50 years of ocean and coastal conservation. So back to sanctuaries and our 50 year anniversary of the National Marine Sanctuary System. So what are these places? Uh, these dots on the map represent uh, our national marine sanctuaries and the triangles are our marine national monuments. NOAA manages a system of 15 marine protected areas called sanctuaries and two marine national monuments encompassing more than 620,000 square nautical miles. So this is an area larger than the state of Alaska. We protect these special ocean places as well as protecting special places in the Great Lakes. The yellow boxes on this map actually represent proposed sanctuary sites that are undergoing a possible designation process in the very near future. So national marine sanctuaries are set aside for a variety of reasons uh, from, and they all have their own history and purpose. In some cases, they're set aside because of the immense biodiversity and ecological elements of the ocean or Great Lakes area. In other cases, uh, they're set aside to protect cultural and maritime heritage assets like the shipwreck. In most cases, they're there to provide shelter also for threatened and endangered marine life like this threatened Hawaiian green sea turtle or Honu. Our National Marine Sanctuaries Act that is also celebrating our 50th year Technically, our birthday is October 23rd, later this year, but we are celebrating all year long. But we're mandated to conduct education and outreach, as well as research and monitoring. And we do this all in an effort to protect the resources, the ecosystems, the habitats, the marine life that can be found in these special underwater treasures. And these places are not just for research and monitoring. They're special ocean areas like a national park, but underwater, like a national forest. And so we encourage people like yourself to get out there and enjoy spectacular, right? You can kayak in these beautiful places. You can fish, snorkel, scuba dive, surf. You can get on a boat and view marine wildlife. And we're hopeful that some of you get so inspired by these spectacular places that you get involved and you actually start volunteering for us. Uh, we have a wide variety of volunteer and citizen science projects going around 
all throughout the country. Uh, one more point I wanted to make here is that marine protected areas like national marine sanctuaries and marine national monuments, these are nature-based solutions that can really help with climate resilience. They help by storing carbon and protecting biodiversity. So um, as part of America, the beautiful initiative of protecting 30% of public lands and waters by the year 2030, national marine sanctuaries can be part of that solution as well. Um, so hoping to continue to save spectacular, which is our tagline for our 50th anniversary. And before I introduce our keynote speaker today, I wanted to just let you know that we have a number of great resources in celebration of our 50th anniversary that I wanted to quickly point out. Uh, first off, we've got these commemorative posters that our graphic designer, Matt McIntosh, has been making. Uh, we're going in order of sanctuary designation, starting with our country's very first sanctuary, the Monitor, which is protecting the USS Monitor and ironclad Civil War shipwreck, and then moving toward the Channel Islands, which is off the California coast where I am in Santa Barbara, Ventura area. And these posters are fantastic um, and we're hoping you can download them from online and in some cases we have a few limited edition print copies. We also are excited to announce that we've worked with the U.S. Postal Service and in early August you can walk into your post office and get your uh, special uh, forever stamps that are celebrating our underwater treasures in the National Marine Sanctuary System. So we encourage you to pursue that. For those educators that are participating online today, we have worked with the National Park Trust. If you're an elementary school teacher or an after school group, we have these great themed collections specific for elementary. We also have these wonderful resource collections that are topically based, uh, whales, kelp forest ecosystems, coral reef ecosystems, ocean acidification, et cetera. So, with that, I will go ahead and introduce our presenter today, uh, Dr. Steve Giddings, also known as Dr. G. He is the Chief Scientist for the NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, before that, he was the manager or the superintendent of the Flower Garden Banks site, our National Marine Sanctuary in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, he has worked in the field of conservation science his entire career helping characterize and monitor marine ecosystems, assessing damage and recovery following ship groundings and oil spills, and applying science to management. Next year marks his 50th year as a diver, 40 of which he has been a scientific diver. And Steve has designed traps to catch lionfish in waters beyond scuba depth. I wanted to also point out that Steve has a few special guests that will be joining us. You can see them listed here. And throughout Steve's presentation, he will be introducing these special guests. So with that, Steve, I'm going to pass over the slides to you and let you take it away. Okay, thank you, Claire. Oh, and Steve, go. There's your webcam. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, is my. Uh, can you see the slides in total? You are ready to go. Okay, good. Excellent. Because my, my picture is covering up part of my slide on my screen, but that, that I can move it. Okay. So, thank you all for letting me interrupt your happy hour. I know if there's 15 countries, somebody's having happy hour now, and uh, maybe a few more than one or two time zones, and some of you might be at work and um, maybe some of you are doing both. I don't know. But thanks for letting me take some time and the rest of us as well. I'm really excited to have these other folks talk to you as well. Um, but I want to start with a quick pretest to talk to you about the some of this talk's gonna be about science and and the rest of the talk will be about a lot of the people involved in the work related to lionfish. So I wanted to start with a little pretest and ask you if you've kept up with the science of lionfish because it's come a long way over the years. And um, this question asks, in what life stage does lionfish grow the fastest? And um, the answer to that is, is uh, oh, hey, Claire, am I not advancing for some reason? Uh, let's see. There we there go. You go. Okay, I'm, I'm good now. So uh, the answer to that question was not A, B, or C, but D. It's uh, 
the, the none of those life stages is, is growth rate the fastest, but we've discovered in science that like all fish, every species, the fastest growth rate happens between the time a hunter gets the fish and he tells his friends about it. So that's the fastest time growth rate for a, for a lionfish. Um, and this is Alex Fogg holding up and stretching out, making one look a lot bigger than it really is. He's used to that. So I've changed the title of this talk a little bit since you saw it on the announcement, because um, I'm really trying to give tribute to the people who have worked on lionfish so long and in such a dedicated way. Um, the story itself is, yes, it's a fish story, but it's as much a people story as it is a fish story. Um, and it is playing out right now in front of us all. Um, but this is my way of paying tribute, if I can, to the people who, uh, who made my life interesting over the last decade. <clears throat> This, this is a map of um, the invaded range in red of the lionfish in dark red and the native, where they came from. They came from the Indo-Pacific um, part of the ocean in the Red Sea. Um, so the invasions came in the west, to the Western Atlantic, and it's been one of the most transformative events of our time for the region. Um, the beautiful fish lionfish are, and I'll show you plenty of pictures of them. Um, been, they were introduced in the mid-1980s. Uh, and probably as discarded aquarium pets in South Florida. Uh, they're probably released by owners into these local waters when they decided they were too big for their aquarium or they ate too many other fish um, because they are voracious predators, these fish. No one, no one wants to kill their pets, so they tend to reduce, release them unharmed when really they ought to harm them. <laughs> and you know, one of the more humane ways is like chill your, your pet fish to death, you know, rather than put it out in local waters because it's likely to become a problem for the ecosystem that's going to be much more pain, painful than, than one fish losing its life in a freezer. Um, this is a map that was put together by Pam Schofield in the early days of the invasion, or to, started in the early days of the invasion, and showing how the spread happened. These fish showed up in the mid-1980s in South Florida, and up until about 2000, nothing really happened except they stayed in South Florida. Then they must have crossed a reproductive threshold and um, you know, the, the rate of expansion became ex exceptional after that. It really woke the science community up. The, this tracking map shows that um, they, by 2005, they had gone up the East Coast and out to Bermuda and out to the Bahamas uh, as well. And 2010, they'd spread across the, um, the Northern and most of the Caribbean and by 2015 into the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, it's just a been a real handy map to show how this spread of this species occurred. <clears throat> I want to give tribute first to the scientists along the way who started first, really. They, they really noticed some bad things going on in, when lionfish started spreading in the 2000s. And really important science was done by these folks uh, and among others, you know, James Morris, Stephanie Green, Mark Albans, Mark Hickson. Um, the last three there were at Oregon State, James is with NOAA. Uh, their goal was really to understand why the fish were spreading so fast, um, trying to understand the impacts to native species and, and how these species might be controlled. There's another person who needs a lot of tribute, Lad Akins. He did tireless work for over a decade in the early days of lionfish invasion to track it and to understand the impacts and to teach the public about the invasion, to um, train people to hunt and handle lionfish safely because they have venomous spines on them. You have to be very careful. Um, and for a very long time, the names Lad Akins and lionfish were synonymous, in, inseparable. A lot of, of, some of what they did, this, this group of scientists and others, was help develop plans in the early days to help countries and regions and uh, programs like the Marine Sanctuary Program come up with action plans on what are we going to do to educate the public, control the species, et cetera. What kind of science needs to be done, what kind of monitoring, et cetera. And a lot of what we see happening today is directly a reflection of what they wrote in these plans back in the early 2000s. Um, the map of dispersal that you saw before, and I replaced that with some arrows showing how, the, how this happened starting in South Florida. Um, the, the, the rapid spread was really due to the fact that these animals have a very high rate of reproduction once they get going. In fact, they, they, they even spread farther south into South America 
Um, there's only been one report, as far as I know, from South America in Brazil. But um, it looks like they all they really need to do is get past the Orinoco and the um, Amazon River, the fresh water there, and they'll probably be able to um, inhabit South America pretty far on down the coast, just like they have in the, in the North America. So, uh, but you can see how much, you know, they reproduce very rapidly, putting out many, many, many eggs uh, per female. This is each female putting out a couple million eggs a year. So it's a big, big issue. And in this invaded range where they've come, they don't have any natural predators. Um, and for some reason, native predators have not really picked up on the fact that these are really tasty fish if you can get past those spines. Um, but uh, there's there's been a few reports of predata predation on lionfish, but not enough to um, to make a dent in their population. Now, and humans learned early on how easy lionfish are to to shoot and how good their meat is, but for some reason, native species haven't yet done that. We call them superfish often because lionfish really are tough and they can tolerate a, a high temperature and salinity range. They live over a very large depth range down to a thousand feet. Um, and of course, these venomous spines stop a lot of pred predators from consuming them, at least when they get big. Um, and the fish that, that were introduced had to run the gauntlet uh, between the time they were collected in the Pacific and transported, thrown in boxes, thrown on airplanes, and put in the you know the aquarium industry or stores and then sold to people and put in their aquariums. They went through hell for a long time, um, and only the toughest made it that far. Those that were eventually released into the Atlantic almost certainly had no diseases, no parasites, none of the other natural controls that keep them from becoming highly reproductive and highly successful in an invaded um, area like that. And you know the native animals that our own fish uh, they they have no evolutionary or practical experience suggesting they need to be fearful of these lionfish and that leads us really to the to problem with the you know the massive impacts they've had they eat just about anything they can get their mouths around and um, they they consume a lot of native species not a lot of animals are quite gluttonous all, all these all these, just about anything, they, like I said, they can fit in their mouth. Um, they're just being lionfish, of course, but uh, it's very destructive to local ecosystems. Um, so the, the impact of a single lionfish, it's bad enough, as the aquarium people found out. But um, imagine putting, you know, e even as few as a couple hundred lionfish on a single reef, which is not unusual at all. There are many more than that on most reefs. Um, you know, 200 fish can eat a million native animals per year. That's starting to have a real impact. And um, Stephanie Green did work on this and, then, and found out that the declines in native fish can be staggering and happen over just a couple of years. So the lionfish can reduce populations by over 60% and biomass as well, and the number of species on a, on a, uh, a native reef. So, um, the reef impacts, you know, like I said, they can take over half the fish off these reefs. You can take specialists off the reefs that are really needed for important functions like cleaner, cleaner fish. And when the cleaners are gone, other fish that need to be cleaned and, and all fish need to be cleaned regularly uh, really suffer from maladies that they wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, they also, you know, like I said, they're generalists. So they, they'll take herbivores, carnivores, they don't care what. And when you start taking herbivores off the reef, you start getting algae overgrowth, which competes with coral sponges and everything else that naturally grows on the reefs. And um, of course, the impacts compound because of that. You're not just taking animals off the reef, but you're reducing the functions that those animals provide. Economically, um, you have to think about the fact that these things are also eating juveniles of species that you and I buy at the stores regularly snapper and grouper and every bunch of hogfish and anything else they can eat when they're young because all those fish start out small and the problem here is that those fish don't enter the adult phase so they can start reproducing and replacing other species that are taken by fishing uh, of the native community so this 
you know, again, compounds the problem. It's a delayed effect because they eat these juveniles early and it's a few years later when we notice that the adults are not being replaced that have been fished out. So um, it, it can take a while to show up. Uh, but when lionfish get in lobster traps, lobster tend not to go in those traps. So that can reduce catches of lionfish, of uh, lobsters by the fishermen. And of course their uh, profits are cut into by that. Um, and then fishermen themselves, when they catch lionfish, they take them out of the traps or the nets or whatever. Uh, they, the spines, when they get stung by a lionfish, you know it, and it really hurts. And it can debilitate you for hours or days, some people days at a time, um, unless you treat it the right way early on. So you can lose time to working uh, on fishing boats and so forth, oil rigs as well. They've found oil guys getting hit by these things when they're divers in the water. So uh, yeah, you gotta be really careful around the venomous spines. Um, a lot of, some people ask about how lionfish are different in their invaded range than they were in their natural habitats uh, in the Western Pacific and the Indian Ocean. They, they actually find life quite a bit easier in the Atlantic than they did at home. Um, aside from not encountering predators very often, the Atlantic fish are easy, uh, easy prey for the lionfish because they just don't know, have an instinctual fear of them. Uh, so lionfish eat a lot more in the Atlantic than they do in their native range and they actually can develop obesity problems. They're much bigger than they are in their native range because of the easy food access. Um, another difference is that they tend to eat parrotfish, which is one of those herbiv herbivores I was talking about in the Atlantic, and they don't tend to do that in their native habitat. And parrotfish are important herbivores in the Atlantic and their loss can mean the, um, you know, lead to real problems with algae competition. So the end result is, um, is this unprecedented invasion that we've never seen before in the Atlantic Ocean by a single species. And um, with some places being overrun by lionfish and these kind of abundances are, they're not all that common to see nowadays, but there are places where you'll see this many fish out and about on a reef especially artificial reefs, but they seem to be more loaded with lionfish than even natural reefs. Which ends, you know, kind of act one that I was talking about, the science of the lionfish invasion. And, um, you know, before starting act two, the, the part where I really want to talk a little bit more about the people involved in this invasion, um, I want to acknowledge this problem. It's, I call it a conservation paradox. Um, many of us in the lionfish world think that human removal of lionfish is necessary to protect native biodiversity and ecosystems. Um, we don't want to glorify the killing of lionfish, and I don't want to in this talk, uh, or lose the more important message or an important message, which is that humans have changed the ocean so much through overuse that um, some ecosystems are just unable to respond in ways that they used to to an exotic species showing up like lionfish. Um, that's why conservation nowadays is so, um, so often includes things beyond protection, but more intervention and restoration, things like that for problems of overfishing and pollution and invasive species. You know, we all wish killing lionfish wasn't necessary and that nature could take care of itself, uh, and take care of the problem, but, um, but, given the current condition of the ocean ecosystems and the, the, the uh, lionfish impacts we've already seen, the only way for a true hands-off approach to even have a chance of working to control lionfish would be to completely stop any other kind of exploitation of the ocean resources, including fishing, primarily fishing, and that's just not gonna happen. So it leaves us in this kind of undesirable position, but one that seems to be effective. Um, so here I'm focusing on what a lot of people call the silver lining of this lionfish invasion, the community response, the people, the ingenuity, the relationships that have developed around lionfish. Um, and, you know, while most of the people in this talk, and you'll see, I, want, I show pictures with a lot of people smiling on their faces. Trust me, that most of them are not happy with the state of the ecosystem and the fact that they are having to respond like this. <clears throat> So I wanted to acknowledge that conservation paradox before showing a bunch of smiling hunters here, just not to give you the wrong impression. Um, the 
we all believe that eradication of lionfish is never going to happen now in the Atlantic. There are just too many of them. But we do understand from studies that Stephanie Green and others have done that um, control of lionfish is possible with adequate removal energy. Um, and above about 120 feet where diving occurs, divers have been very successful in spearing lionfish since the outbreak. Uh, there are people committed to lionfish control um, who, who I really consider the superstars of, of this um, response. And we're going to talk about some of them today. There, there are two here involved that I pictured on this slide that, that were involved in equipment development. And perhaps there's no other invention as um, important to the lionfish invasion uh, in controlling its impact or really drawn so much attention of people and so many people to the issue as uh, Ali al Haj's zookeeper, the white container that he's carrying which allows you to transport fish without getting spined by them. Uh, it's a real safe, good safety device that a lot of people have nowadays. There are, man, there are homemade versions of this too, but Zookeeper is by far the most popular of uh, containment devices. And then pole spears were already around, uh, but they were improved for lionfish by Walt Dielman and his uh, lionator spear. Um, so really anybody can just add a good pair of gloves and a scuba tank and uh, you could catch a couple dozen or dozen or more lionfish on a single dive. So let me introduce you to a few more of these superstars uh, of the lionfish invasion. Uh, there was an article in Smithsonian Magazine by Jeff McGregor a couple years ago now uh, calling lionfish hunters a ragtag army. And we all like that um, explanation or that description because it seems so accurate. Uh, because, and he called it that because all these people seem to be straight out of central casting. Uh, there are tons of great and colorful characters working on uh, hunting lionfish, um, and all their stories are worth telling. I wish I had more time to do it. But uh, these, some of these folks are Rachel Bowman, Josh Livingston, Alex Fogg. I'll talk a little bit more about Alex later. Uh, Carol Wall, Holden Harris, Brian Asher, Ad, Andy Lowe, uh, and then a father and son team, Buck and Tristan Beasley um, down in Honduras. Real interesting characters, every one of them committed to lionfish completely. Um, and maybe some of them should just be committed, but really interesting people. I wish I had time to go into details for every one of them, but I, but I really don't. And the competition is fierce between them, let me tell you, but friendly. Um, the whole idea of socializing this problem has been an exceptionally important thing. And there are now derbies out there going on in a number of places. Um, it's a pretty good money, as you can see for winning. Uh, they, they actually are keeping numbers low in a lot of places. The state of Florida, which has a really active lionfish program, uh, even sponsors challenges and offers awards to various types of people for removing lionfish, king and queen of lionfish, for example. Um, and then one of the more important things that's happened is starting this group called Lionfish University by these other two superstars who you're going to hear from in a minute, Stacy Frank and Jim Hart. Um, these were two dive buddies for a long time, and Stacy's a dental hygienist, and, and Jim is a screenwriter, a Hollywood screenwriter. So well, they were just infected by the lionfish bug and started at this nonprofit called Lionfish University um, and a Facebook page that gives people a way to pass information and lessons around um, among all the people interested in doing something about lionfish. They also raise money and they generously support a lot of activities related to lionfish. And Stacy and Jim can say more about Lionfish University uh, activities and you know the things they've been focusing on since 2014 when they um, when the invasion started. So I'm going to ask them to put their faces and, and voices on screen so they can say a little something about that. Jim and Stacy, can you do that? Hi, uh, we're Steve, here. Thank you for that we, introduction, I appreciate that. I know our time is real limited, and we can talk for hours about all of this. But Jim, can you just start out and let everybody know the unofficial story of how we got started? And I'll do the official story briefly. <laughs> uh, to, be, to be brutally honest, I got into the Atlantis invasion and was attracted to it for purely mercenary reasons. I didn't care about the environment, didn't care about ecology, didn't care how many fish they ate, didn't care how many eggs they laid, didn't how many reefs they killed. All I saw was dollar signs because when I first filmed one in Turks and Caicos in 2010, I went, oh good, now I can write a monster movie about lionfish. I can write the next Jaws Sharknado with lionfish. So we did a lot of research, Stacy and I did, and the research was incredible. We learned all these things about it. I went to Hollywood and pitched 
the lionfish are coming, the lionfish are coming. And I got a lot of blank faces and people in the you know industry going, what the hell is a lionfish? And in doing so, I realized that they didn't know what, if they didn't know what a lionfish was, and and it became very apparent that the, the, the general public did not know what was happening under the water to the reefs and to the native juvenile reef fish and the destruction that was going on. It was the worst climate disaster you'd never heard of. And that's when Stacy and I teamed up and decided there was a bigger mission here besides just writing a Hollywood movie. So, and now I'm officially part of the invasion and part of, uh, hopefully part of the silver lining to, um, to control these suckers. So we took all of this information that we've been gathering for a couple of years and meeting various really esteemed researchers in the lionfish invasion. And we decided that we wanted to change our little corner of the ocean since that's our passion is diving and preserving the reefs. So that is how Lionfish University officially began. And that was in 2012 with Jim and myself as co-founders plus my brother, Courtney Platt. And uh, he does all of our, a lot of our photography. Um, so that's, that's how we began. Um, there's so many things that we could talk about that Steve touched on several of them. Um, one of them is our field reporter network, and it's come in extremely handy um, getting information from around the invaded area quickly. We have people all throughout the invaded area that volunteer their time, and we thank everybody who does this. It is a great way to volunteer with Lionfish University. It's super easy, and you just send in photos, and uh, you might start out with just a sentence or two about whatever it is you see, spearing or eating lionfish. Um, Jim, anything else you want to say about that particular? Roger, Roger, Roger Miller is a good example. Uh, he's an insurance salesman by day and a lionfish hunter, kingfisher by every other day and night he can get in the water. Um, he's been one of our most successful field reporters. Uh, and it, you, what you began to see is how different all the people are that are attracted to this invasion, how their lives are changed. That's what got me. I'm friends with people. I've met Steve because of lionfish. Uh, I met Stacy in diving. Um, it's amazing that it doesn't matter what your politics are, what your religion is, what your ethnicity is, what language you speak. You have this one common um, bond that ties you all together, and that's the lionfish invasion. That's what got me about uh, this is a social phenomenon. Um, if it weren't for this lionfish invasion, half the people that I spend most of my day working with now would never have met. Um, and that to me seems to be a good thing. Yeah. And if you would like to volunteer to be a field reporter, just contact us through our website at lionfishuniversity.org. And you can yes. contact Roger through us too. He can share some of the great things that he does way above and beyond. Yeah, Stacy, could you say something about this real quick too, Antigua? Um, quickly, uh, this was one of the projects that we did through Lionfish University, through Dr. Giddings and Martha Watkins Gilks, who is picture there in the, the middle with the flag. Um, she met Steve and she really wanted to save the reefs in Antigua. She was very concerned about the effect of the lionfish there as a way to start out conservation efforts on the island. And she received funding through primarily the Mill Reef Club, Elite Island Resorts and MEPA there and funded five of our team to go in 2019 for the initial reef assessment Steve wrote up a fantastic report about that. Then um, we were invited back, a team of 10 of us, but uh, that little thing, the pandemic got in the way. So we're now rescheduled for November to go back to implement the control methods that we had all suggested um, as our, from our team efforts there. Yeah. Which is a lionfish derby. Yeah. Well, thanks guys, I appreciate that. Um, and there, there are some Thank other you. groups that are important too, but I wanted to pull out Lionfish University because everybody can just now, even now, interact with, through that. Um, but Blue Ventures and others are, in other countries have been very helpful in developing plans and taking action within those countries to start ecotourism, you know, conserve, CI uh, does conservation trips that involve the hunting of lionfish. So there are a lot of things going on in other countries, tourism related, uh, to help to deal with this problem. A lot of organizations have stepped up. So here now my chance to go through a few superstars real quickly. Um, I mentioned Alex Fogg. Uh, you know, 
everyone who knows anything about lionfish knows Alex and has at least seen his videos of him hunting. Um, he's a major player and a go-to expert on everything from, from equipment recommendations to pathology of lionfish. Uh, I don't think there's anyone who has as broad of a knowledge base as Alex in, um, in, on lionfish. Rachel Bowman, oh gosh, we could, this could take hours, but um, describing Rachel Bowman is, uh, as a lionfish huntress doesn't do it. It's like calling Michelangelo an interior designer, you know, just not right. It, it doesn't quite capture any, er, hardly any aspects of her real life, which is she's magically complex in so many ways, tough, driven, unfiltered, generous, loyal, charismatic, and tireless. All those words have to be said to describe her. On land, she can be found tending bar or, um, you know, helping somebody out in some way or another. But Rachel becomes laser focused when she gets in the water on lionfish and uh, captains her own boat called the Brittany Spears. And she's one of the first to realize that lionfish, there was money to be made in lionfish, selling lionfish to, to wholesalers and restaurants. Um, and she had Adolphus Bush over to her house one night when I was there. Go figure, I explain that one. So Rachel's just a great fun person to work with, a real light in my life over the last few years. Um, Ali El Haj, another really fun guy to be around, architect turned zookeeper, um, inventor, businessman. Um, certo, he likes us to call him a certified LHE, lionfish hunter extraordinaire. So, and, and now he has a certificate I made for him there to, to prove that he was, and he actually is, but an exceptionally generous guy uh, to the cause of lionfish control. Phil Carp is completely dedicated to the plight of underprivileged people in other countries and has helped women in multiple places pull themselves out of some really difficult financial and personal situations to, and help them start businesses uh, on their own. Um, manufacturing, selling lionfish jewelry, which is something that's really taken off. All credit to Phil on, on he helping that get started. Scott Ganello, um, retired young, so he could do something about something he really cares about, which is conservation. And um, he, he's starting with the lionfish problem by managing websites and developing apps and games um, to attract attention and educate people and even working on ways to control lionfish with submarines. Uh, this summer, they're doing some tests on that. These two sisters, Polly and Claire, uh, wrote a, they're chefs, they wrote a um, cookbook, which is really excellent for not just lionfish, but other fish as well. So get out and get one of those. There's two book cookbooks out now on lionfish. Uh, Anthony Valiulis, chief supply officer of the new company called Netless Catch. Um, a startup that promotes the distribution of, of lionfish, but also um, supports secondary markets like jewelry, et cetera, and leather, which I'll get into a minute, in a minute. And Anthony, Anthony's constantly looking for ways to diversify and expand the businesses that, that he's starting. Um, David Ventura was with Whole Foods, or is with Whole Foods, and was a pioneer in getting lionfish out to the major retail markets. Um, it still has a long way to go. Lionfish distribution's not worked out quite yet, but um, Dave was instrumental in getting that started. And these two pioneers uh, have developed this magic potion for sting relief for lionfish stings. Uh, I've seen it work repeatedly on, on stings on uh, offshore, and it looks like it has a really bright future. Sting Master is an ointment you rub directly on a sting, and the people I've seen use it uh, get relief within seconds. So I suspect you'll um, soon see it in just about everybody's first aid kits. And then um, Arav Chavda, uh, Roland Salatino, both of them, uh, they started a joint venture with some other folks that you can see in the picture below. Uh, it both sells lionfish as seafood and makes leather from lionfish skin, um, adding even more value to the catches that people bring in. Uh, they started with lionfish and are just now launching uh, some exciting new products uh, using lionfish leather, and they're exploring other species as well. So stay tuned for more from this new company, Eco Leathers. Um, I think it's going to be really exciting to see how that goes. This is a map that shows how lionfish have started to spread across the Mediterranean. It's not all just about the Atlantic. Um, 
So they came through the Suez Canal and have started spreading now across the Western Mediterranean, um, still in its exponential growth phase. So it started moving toward the West. We've been working with a scientist over there from Turkey, Dr. Uh, Eileen Ullman, um, uh, with her on a, a multinational group of scientists as well, of other, as other people and managers from those countries around the Mediterranean on an article that we just published earlier this year. Uh, Eileen works in Turkey. She was the lead author on the paper. Uh, we call our group now Lionfish Universe. So we've taken Lionfish University to another continent and figured it's time for an upgrade of the name for, for this group. Eileen's been really helpful there. And this graphic was in the paper, and I know it might be tough to read it, but uh, we can get it to you separately if you ever need it or want it. But um, it, it, it was really about lessons learned in the Western Atlantic that can use in the uh, Mediterranean to deal with the lionfish invasion over there. And all the things in green here are things that we found that worked in the Atlantic, and the things in red really didn't work. So the, some of the things that worked here involve, um, you know, har harvesting lionfish, as I mentioned before, tournaments, um, cooperation between countries, and encouraging these commercial markets. The things that really haven't worked in the, in the Western Atlantic involve bounties and, um, and also trying to train local fish to eat lionfish. It just hasn't been successful yet, as far as we can tell. And it's actually led to some other problems. A couple other superstars, uh, Nikos is selling alien, uh, you know, invasive species as seafood now in a business he started um, in Greece. And uh, kind of one of those superstars in the Mediterranean trying to help deal with this problem. Um, he's a scientist as well. Um, we're in, so his mission is really to promote sustainable seafood focused on invasive species. So, so Act 2 really comes to an end here with the satisfying insight about what Jim was talking about, the people of the lionfish invasion. And um, uh, none of us who were thrown together by this crisis really care about the differences that usually separate people. You know, our backgrounds, our ethnicities, our looks, our politics. Um, you know, we, we care that um, that each of us in our own way is, is so dedicated to the, to, the, to the problem that we've donated money and volunteered our time to, um, to do something about something we really care about. Um, I, I, I start a joke that I've never finished yet. A, a dental hygienist, a high, Hollywood screenwriter, and a scientist walk into a bar. And that's literal because that's, that's where it all started for me with Jim and Stacy. Um, I don't have a punchline yet for that joke, but but we all have our stories. And, um, you know, like, like other fish stories, some of them are true. Uh, the, but we all realize that without lionfish, our paths may never have crossed. And our lives are literally enriched because of lionfish. Um, this is Alex Fogg again. Uh, it's, you know, Act 3, it's still being written, the future of the lionfish invasion. What will become of the people that have been involved uh, and the fish themselves? Um, and by the way, don't try this at home or anywhere else. Alex found out within a couple seconds that this was this was a mistake. It didn't end well. <laughs> um, but back to the future of lionfish. Most of what we know about invasive species comes from terrestrial rivers, lakes, et cetera. Not so much from the ocean. But most species follow a curve that exponentially increases to a peak. And then after the peak, they settle into some equilibrium at some level where Nature's more or less taking care of the problem, but they work themselves into the natural system. Um, we don't know with, with lionfish uh, where this is going to end, but we do believe in a lot of places we may be at the peak or beyond it and looking for that um, equilibrium level. It was just not there yet, so we're just not sure where it's going to go. <clears throat> and um, we still are hopeful about natural controls like predation. Maybe some of these fish that have eaten lionfish somewhat will pick it up and pick up the pace and, and do more about it. Maybe some diseases and parasites might take over and start to reduce the reproductive potential of these animals. Um, it, some of that might be happening, but we're, it's not clear how much. Um, still, you know, many of us who have noticed that uh, there are places where lionfish abundances don't seem to be as high as they, we expected them to be. So that's a good sign. But we all need to continue to watch and, and report lionfish where, you know, whether they're high or low abundances in different places. And the Lionfish Facebook page is one place to do that. The 
Lionfish Patrol app that Scott Gonello put together is another. In shallow water, we think that um, the future of control is still going to be human. Uh, we all know how sex successful shallow water removals can be or have been, uh, particularly with regular culling and derbies. Um, so I don't know if we want to trust the future to these, these, this ragtag army, but uh, these are good people right here and good hunters, every one of them. Underwater and deeper water, we, we're looking at ROVs and, and robots that of various types that are operated from the surface. The one on the left will electrocute lionfish if you get the lionfish between those paddles. And the one on the right will uh, can spear lionfish remotely. So there are some things being looked at. Both of those are still experimental. Lot, uh, submarines are being looked at for suction or for spearing lionfish in deep water, you know, a fleet of submarines. Scott Cassell is working with Scott Canelo this summer to test a sub down in the Florida Keys on just, just those things. Uh, lobster fishermen and fish trap uh, fishermen will probably continue to catch lionfish in their traps in deep water. Uh, but the problem is they, they have the other issues that I explained where they don't get what they're really looking for, lobsters and the fish that they're trying to target. Uh, but, but they will continue to bring in lionfish and sell them at a profit because lionfish can, in some countries, um, make more money than some other fish because they are kind of a delicacy, and especially in the U.S. Um, and I've been working with others on a trap. Uh, um, the um, It's a lionfish-specific trap, and it's a foldable purse trap. It lays open on the bottom, just exposing the net, laying the net across the bottom, but exposing a vertical structure that lionfish are attracted to. Lionfish aren't attracted to bait, so you don't need bait. They are attracted to structure more than other fish. So you can see how they've accumulated around this this, um, this foam pad in the middle of the trap. And um, then when the trap is pulled, the net is loose. It folds around the fish before they realize that they're caught inside the trap. So it's, it's this is the one that was tested by Holden Harris for part of his dissertation work. This is my superstar trap design consultant, Peter Angelotti, exceptional guy. Um, he's given me really great construction ideas, ways to improve the traps. And uh, he's the guy that builds the traps now more than other people. So um, Rachel and Peter are partners. Peter, Rachel calls Peter sexy boyfriend, and uh, they really should be a power couple because they're both exceptional people. Um, Peter, exceptionally intelligent guy who who has like I said great ideas especially about you know mechanics um, and how to do things better but you know he may have been held back a little bit by some poor life decisions that he's made and like I said I don't have time to go into all the details but suffice it to say that he told me that Lonesome Dove is the best book he ever read in jail so I'll move on from there <laughs> uh, I hope a lot of you get to meet Peter one of these days really fun guy um so I'm, i got a little video i want to show you of deploying these traps this is uh, how i deploy the lionfish trap that i'm working on and you can see it goes down closed um so if you ever happen to have a like a, a bycatch in there on a previous lift you can send the fish back down to the bottom and recompress them but when it gets to the bottom those two curved pieces extend hit the bottom first and they force the jaws apart and force it to open. And then they, uh, the buoyant fad, the fish attraction device in the center just stands up and it lays there. And then when you pull the trap up, uh, you just the harness pulls closed through that loop in the center of it. And you'll see the very loose netting billows in a way that doesn't disturb the lionfish that are inside the trap before the thing is completely closed. And that's how you catch the lionfish and pull them up. So you get very low bycatch because there's no bait and because lionfish are so much more attracted to these traps than uh, other fish are. Right now, these traps are in commercial tests that are being led by Ali Candelmo and um, Lex Bryant uh, in, down in the Florida Keys. They're being tested by commercial lobstermen under the direction of these two ladies uh, who work at the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. So we're really asking the fishermen to tell us do these work? Will they make a profit? How do you fish them effectively? Can you get them in the right place close enough to reefs to catch your fish and so forth? And boy, if, you know, that's kind of the final test on these traps. They did fine in, 
in experimental tests, but now it's time for commercial testing. So I'm really hopeful there. And commercialization of lionfish is a big deal. Um, you know, there's a good demand for seafood. We just need to get the distribution networks in place and, um, and people will buy lionfish if they have access to them. The, like I said, seafood demand is there, but also there are a lot of secondary products being developed like jewelry, like leather, like dips, and um, it's on and on it's gonna go, I think. Lionfish are gonna continue to, to be very marketable and the price will, you know, the value of the fish will be high because of all these secondary markets. So the protecting these native ecosystems could end up being this two-pronged approach, removal by divers in shallow water and, and maybe a deep water fishery using other techniques. And combined, we're gonna help supply this diversifying uh, market demand. So with that, and we're getting ready to close here, I wanna introduce you to somebody, uh, a good friend of mine and a really true conservation superstar to close us out. Uh, you may know Megan from the free diving records that she set from television, from movies, from stunt work she's done, from modeling sports where uh, in any number of places, but she's also a person that really lives conservation in ways that we really should all copy. Um, so let me introduce you real quickly to, to the incomparable Megan Haney Greer. Megan. Oh man, thank you, Steve. That was that was an awesome introduction. I appreciate you. So before, uh, I move on to my piece here, and on behalf of the team, this dynamic lineup of superstars that you've been learning about from Steve is simply not complete without paying tribute to Dr. Steve Giddings himself. So flip to the next slide, please, Dr. G. There we go. All right. Uh, Steve really, I mean, he has made invaluable contributions to helping navigate and tackle the lionfish invasion and so many other aspects of conservation throughout his incredible uh, career and many different angles. But uh, one of them that you were just seeing, if you didn't catch that, that Steve designed that purse trap that he was just going over. So he designed that and got it patented. So. Um, you know, and and it all started in his garage. So he he claims that he's a garage engineer, and that was one of his crafts that came out of that out of there. And um, but Steve is very quick with his creative ideas, and also has this awesome ability to just bring people together. He's the ultimate thread that's always connecting the dots between groups and individuals. And this is true of myself as well. Um, meaning Steve connected me, introduced me to Jim and Stacy with Lionfish University. And that's how I came on board with the LFU team and how I'm here. So it's been awesome working with this whole team. And um, here's to you, Steve, you're a true superstar and I'm looking forward to all of the adventures to come with this crew. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so with that, uh, I will just wrap up with some words here about conservation and something I like to call conservation empowerment, uh, which basically is, is, something, is a way that, you know, understanding how and what you can do right now to make a difference. And, you know, in this whole lionfish invasion, the diversity of people that have responded to this, I believe can serve as such a great example for the rest of us. They show what can happen when we decide to apply our own special skills, which I always call superpowers, to a problem. And if you just think about, you know, over all of the, the superstars Steve was covering, about all the different talents and unique contributions that you've just learned about with everybody bringing their superpower to the table. So I call myself, as you can see in the picture there, the imperfect conservationist. And this is because like all of us, I often find myself feeling very overwhelmed by the world's problems, uh, especially lately. And the thing is with conservation, uh, because the stakes are really high with the environment and human rights and climate change and all this stuff coming at us, we try to take it all on right? And we set the bar just too high for ourselves of what we can do. You know, we try to do it all and do it perfectly. And in that way, we're setting ourselves up to fail and be discouraged. 
so what do we do instead? Well, instead of taking it all on, I challenge you, each one of you that has chosen to come and join us here tonight, and learn more about lionfish and the people uh, making some changes with that. I challenge you to make small, sustainable changes in your daily life. And by doing that, they become manageable and just a habit, a regular part of your everyday. So as an example, I'm talking about really small things like remembering your reusable water bottle and then just filling it when you see it instead of grabbing that easy, convenient plastic bottle or bagging your groceries at the car when you've inevitably forgotten your, you know, your reusable bags. Again, I do that all the time. Um, and the, this is one of my favorites, but like shutting off your engine, it's called puffing if you're just sitting there with your car engine on. Um, if you're going to be parked for more than 10 seconds, when you do the math and the research, that is the magic number. So I call it the 10 second rule. These, uh, you know, they're small changes that everybody can make. And are these things alone going to change it all? No. But maybe you've heard the saying, blessed is he who plants a tree under whose shade he will never sit. And I, I really like this one. And I've been thinking a lot about it lately. And it, that's because I think it's such a good reminder for all of us that even when it may be or feel insignificant now, make no mistake, our choices, your choices, and taking action, it all makes a difference in being part of the solution. So with that, I will say small actions drive big change. And when we take these small steps to make positive change that we are in control of, we improve not only the immediate world around us, but this good stuff is contagious too, and it catches on. And in that way, you serve as an inspiration for others to make positive changes too. So that, in a nutshell, is this conservation empowerment. And as long as we're embracing our imperfections and giving ourselves the hall pass that we're not going to do it all and do it all perfectly, together we make a difference. So no matter who you are, there is something about you that can help solve a problem. And in this case, we've been learning about lionfish, but really this can apply to anything. Ocean, diving, cooking, art, storytelling, uh, finance, legal, organizing, I mean, you name it, the list is endless. And as long as you care enough to take that first step, you may surprise yourself and others with just how much difference that you can make. Um, you know, lives, as you can see, have literally been changed by the lionfish invasion and everybody coming together. And I really, I just in closing, I want to challenge you to make some small changes in your day-to-day -day life and also ask yourself, what do you care about? What issue? What is, gets you excited and are you passionate about? And what is your unique, unique gift or superpower that you can bring to it? and drive change with that. So thank you all for being here. I'm gonna turn the mic back over to Steve. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you all. Yeah, thanks Megan, appreciate it. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Claire because um, she can take back control, I believe, right? Claire? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Steve, Megan, and mm -hmm. Stacy, Jim. Greatly appreciate um, today's presentation. I mean, I myself thoroughly enjoyed it. Let me get my screen back up. Uh, we have a couple of questions. We are running out of time. However, I will ask one question that a few people asked Steve. You know, what are the predators of lionfish in their natural natural habitat? Like, how are they kept in check in their native region? Yeah, there there are you know grouper type fish over in the Pacific and things like that that will eat lionfish. Um, their abundances actually are quite low in their native range, so it's not like you see much predation going on over there. So. Probably there's other things that control their populations as well, like things that eat their eggs or the juveniles or the larval, you know, stages of lionfish. They never get to be adults. So it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to just eat adult lionfish to be, to control their populations. And so we're hoping that in even the Atlantic, things will learn to eat those other life stages. Excellent. Thank you for that, Steve. Um, there's a few extra questions. We'll send them out to Steve following today's presentation. Uh, this, this event has been recorded. It'll be on our archive page. The link will come to you over email, so don't be concerned. Uh, also wanted to just point out that all attendees on today's webinar will get a copy of a certificate of attendance for the event uh, about lionfish, and that'll come over email. 
We also take our evaluation pretty seriously at NOAA and, and our education programs. So there's about a one to two minute evaluation that, sh that pops up when you close out of today's GoToWebinar event. Uh, there's also a QR code here. There's a, a three minute survey that NOAA Office of Education is doing um, that's kind of more about multimedia and distance learning. So go ahead and scan that. It'll also be shared with you in a follow-up email. And uh, yeah, do everything that Megan was saying, those little steps of daily conservation to help us save spectacular, save America's underwater treasures and to keep these ecosystems healthy for now and for future generations. Hey, and with are, that, yeah. Can you quickly say something about that one pager that we put together for the information? Yeah, there is a handout that can be downloaded in the GoToWebinar control panel. It'll also be included in an email that uh, follows up from today's webinar. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for learning more about invasive lionfish. Thanks to uh, Steve, Dr. G, and our guest speakers. Uh, we're so pleased that you could all be with us today. And this concludes today's presentation. Take care. Thanks all. Thank you.